Good morning, everybody. Today is March 15, 2023. I'm Jens Chapman, and good morning from the beautiful Seattle Science Foundation facilities. Um, this is our STED Talk segment, Spine Technology Education Discovery, Discourse, um, Debate, whatever you want to call it, D4, the multiple interpretations. Uh, today we have a really cool program. There's no CME attached to this. Um, we have Kyocera Medical Technologies to thank for our uh, visiting professors here in person. Professor Kirk Wood is going to be here in person. He's going to arrive any second. And he's going to talk about uh, cages and how to make them more successful in terms of a bio implant and a biomechanical structure. So he's a professor at Stanford. I'm going to more formally introduce him when he arrives. He's on his way here, so I'm told. Um, I hope you'll also join us April 1st for our ninth annual Advanced Lateral Approach to the Spine course. Um, this is again going to have state-of-the-art technologies, access technologies, as well as implant uh, options, and it's a true world star um, meeting, uh, co-chaired uh, by the main names in the field, Dr. Spimenta, and others will be there, and obviously Dr. Oskurian, who's had a hand in the development of far lateral approaches. Um, so this will be a great meeting to have. As always, we'll start with a couple of case presentations, and these case presentations are meant to fuel debate. I'm going to go online to the chat room, and we welcome, obviously, any and all of your questions and thoughts about this. And we have three cases prepared that will all revolve around inner body fusions and why, what worked, and what did not work. To start things off, Dr. Jared Cook is going to talk about a case that recently came to us, and we don't have a final resolution yet, but in terms of discussion points and learning points about spine surgery and what to use, when and where and how, I thought this is a pretty good case. And I thank Jared in advance for putting this together. So Jared, without much further ado, thank you. All right, so let's start off talking about uh, this patient, a 46-year-old female, uh, came in with uh, mid-low back pain, bilateral lower extremity pain and weakness, um, uh, developed a, a right foot drop in the, in the last couple of months. Um, it was a extensive history, a two-story fall from a helicopter during uh, military service in the 90s, um, uh, numerous illnesses, spine surgeries uh, since the incident, a couple car accidents. Uh, since 2009, it's at 21 uh, spine surgeries um, uh, that includes, you know, two spinal cord stimulators, a bone stimulator, intrathecal pain pump with, uh, with Dilaudid, um, uh, you know, uh, also a, a domestic violence victim uh, history. Um, so we see the physical exam, um, you know, uh, up there, just uh, lower extremity uh, uh, deficits uh, bilaterally. <laughs> so. Can you, can you go back? <clears throat> So what do you make of those motor deficits? Are they focal? Is that diffuse? Is there a pattern that you can tell? Uh, it's, it's pretty diffuse. There's, there's really not a, um, a pattern that I can, that I can point to. Uh, I mean, it seems like at, at least some of it is limited, um, you know, secondary to pain. Um, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, perceived, uh, you know, perceived effort. Um, but yeah, no, nothing that I can really point to. So, um, so in the surgical history, so this is, you know, obtained from, uh, you know, from chart review from, you know, outside records. Um, so it all, you know, it started in uh, 2009 with uh, an ALIF and uh, posterior fusion at uh, L45 and L5S1, then uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, chronic pain syndrome, had a spinal cord stimulator placed, uh, a couple of sacroiliac joint fusions, um, uh, an extension uh, of the fusion for um, you know what, what sounds like a, a small disc herniation, um, and then in 2019, uh, an extension of the fusion from uh, L2 up to T12 for pseudoarthrosis and rod fracture at L23. So um, you know the images that are available are just what we have in you know in our system. So this is. You know, this is where we stand. Um, you know, at this point, without having um, you know any any of that any of the uh, prior imaging. So, um, you know, one thing that you know that we can see here, and we have a nice new clicker that can point. Um, so we've got our uh, our dilated pain pump there, the bilateral SI joint fusions. We have two independent constructs that are then linked um, with uh, you know, nearly full length um, uh, you know, additional rods. And um, 
So without full on standing films, some of this is uh, just a bit of a guesstimate, um, but uh, you know, we can we can see that there's likely some uh, some element of a coronal plane uh, malalignment. Um, as far as you know, sagittal malalignment, there's you know there's suggestion um, that uh, there's probably about a 27 degree PILL mismatch with your um, uh, with your lumbar lordosis being about 27. Um, then you can see on the flexion film that uh, a, a 20 degree focal kyphosis um, at uh, um, at the UIV plus one is uh, is present um, compared to the uh, the uh, standing neutral films. Um, so you know, just a development of uh, of PJK at that point. Um, you know, can't really speak to uh, exact sagittal alignment at this point. Um, as far as what everything looks like, um, the sacroiliac joints we can see there just there isn't really any evidence of a fusion. There are just you know three devices on each side that are present. Um, everything else uh, does appear to have a solid fusion with the exception of the uh, upper instrumented level. Uh, this doesn't appear to, there's no inner body fusion and it doesn't appear to have uh, any, uh, any posterior fusion mass, but everything else is solid. So uh, were those put in uh, percutaneously, that upper fusion end, or how was that done? Was that through a conventional open procedure as far as you know? Uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, Conventional uh, open um, in order to uh, to create that um, that extended rod construct. Um, so yeah, that was that was done open. And um, is there loosening around the screws? Is there any uh, sign of metallosis on MRI skin? Or how does how was this worked up so far? Um, so there's there's no evidence of loosen, loosening around the screws that uh, that I can tell, and trust me, I looked. Um, <clears throat> so far, there you know there hasn't been uh, you know any workup. This uh, patient just you know just came to us, and so the workup is uh, you know has been initiated at this point. Um, so I can go to the next slide and show you what the what the workup plan is. It's pretty extensive. So. Um... Again, this is a very problematic case in many regards. So is there, did I get that right, a both a dorsal calm stimulator and an intrathecal pain pump in place? Um, so the intrathecal pain pump is in place. There were two prior dorsal column stimulators. Both of them were removed and um, the leads you can see, so these leads used to be up at T8. Um, you know, they, it looks like uh, they were probably trying to be removed and that was abandoned when they got stuck. That's my best guess. Um, but there are no generators uh, at this point. So, um, you know, on the, on that list of 21 surgeries, um, you know, includes two insertions of, uh, of stimulators and two removals. Um, and then there was also a, uh, a bone stimulator that was uh, implanted and then uh, subsequently removed um, uh, after that pseudoarthrosis that she that she had. Yeah. Well, this is very problematic. We have our visiting professor here, Professor Kirk Wood has arrived. You get to have Dr. Oskuyan's seat right here with a microphone. Good morning, Kirk. So I'll give you a handshake. Thanks for coming. Great to see you. So this is Jared, uh, and we always have a couple of cases first to underscore points. Uh, do you mind going to the beginning slide again? Uh, just very briefly, because this is one of those problems. So we have three cases, the first of three. Um, this is a 46-year-old female. You see the thing, 21 spine surgeries after a helicopter crash, uh, I guess, with the military in 1990s. So uh, 21 spine surgeries, spinal cord stimulators times two generators, uh, uh, intrathecal pain pump, and um, diffuse neuro exam, we've identified this is not really prifocal. Uh, there's a significant amount of pain limitation in there. And again, Jared, do you mind going forward to the final x-rays? And this is the litany of stuff now. And we don't have a standing just to preempt that scoliosis, right? That's in the That's plan. That's in the plan, but she came to clinic. And again, we have not done anything, yet, but this is what we're confronted with. So there's a lot to unravel here uh, as you're uh, going through 21 spine procedures in a row. Um, and somewhere this is obviously what so many members of society are worried about our profession when we have this litany of expensive and sometimes dangerous procedures and the patient is as unhappy if not more than before. And um, here they are. So a lot of effort was spent into, quote, fusing the spine. Let's just start with the SI joints. What are your thoughts on these metal 
uh, uh, stubs that basically create something that I have termed metallusion, because it's not really a fusion, it's a stabilization procedure, and the company now has made amendments in their statements that this is a fusion. It's a stabilization device that has metal surface. So what are your thoughts on these kind of metal devices that uh, don't really create a fusion across the true joint, uh, but have some form of a stabilizing effect through the surface characteristics? And the SI joints basically just look like that at this point. There's no evidence of any fusion through these. Well, I think uh, the treatment of the sacroiliac joint with surgery like this to me falls into the category of a lot of things that we do in spine. In other words, if you're holding a screwdriver, the whole world looks like a screw. And there are people, very thoughtful and uh, intelligent-minded individuals, leaders of our societies, who firmly believe that huge portions of low back pain is coming from the sacroiliac joint. And there are others who um, do not at all. So just like low back pain and fusions for that, I think early in your career, you maybe decide whether that's true or not in your mind. Um, it's, <clears throat> I have not, I actually do believe in this in carefully selected situations, but not across the board. But it, it's interesting what you show on the pictures here. Um, does there have to be bone uh, crossing that uh, uh, joint or does, if bone has grown into that peg on both sides, such that it doesn't move, is that not a fusion? It, it's hard to say. Um, again, I think in the right individuals, I think this is an appropriate thing. And in my, I haven't uh, scientifically looked it all up, but I believe my results are probably no different than my results for everything else we do in spine about four out of five people can do well. That fifth one doesn't do so well. Right. Um, in this era now, with 21 spine surgeries and a very unhappy patient, right? I mean, the patient is... Uh, I'm trying to find something that hasn't been done. Yeah. So how do we picture. unravel this in terms of if there's any role for any further intervention, or do we send this patient to a no longer existent comprehensive pain program that has multi-dimensional um, resources available. Again, in our area, they started here at UW and they're gone pretty much. There's one or two left that kind of do a stripped down version of that. But what do we do with a patient? How do we start evaluating this patient <clears throat> formally? Yes, scoliosis systems are done. And yes, we had a, uh, one of our commenters asked for a standing uh, clinical pictures, great point. We don't have that. We actually routinely don't do that. That's a great point. We do it for uh, we don't do it for a reason. Um, what did she stand like? How did she uh, this patient function? Uh, it's it, it's kind of uh, you know just a, a pain avoidance kind of posture. Um, you know she'll she can't really stand up straight. There's a lot of leaning on the knees. Um, so under rehabilitated really for sure. Yeah, despite for having sure. A stable quote stable spine. <laughs> So, so again, this patient comes to your uh, well-known Stanford clinic, and yes, I know you're a go-to person for problem spines in the entire West Coast. So, <laughs> how do you how do you unpack this patient? Do you just uh, clinically examine, look at the X-rays, and say they're okay, or are there tests you'd like to order when you have this kind of a fusion disease? Well, I think as we do pretty much with everything else, it begins, you know, with listening and talking and hearing the history of the patient and. In the back of our minds uh, as spine surgeons, you know, um, when we're visiting with a new person or, or a return patient, always in some corner, we're, th we're asking ourselves, is this something that can be helped with surgery? And in this case, is this something that could be helped with a fusion? Because you're probably not doing just a decompression on this individual if you do anything. So what does a fusion do? A fusion basically stops something from moving, and that's the way it seeks to um, stop pain. You're not scooping out cancer or an infection or something like that. You're stopping something from moving. So the history, you would like to hear something that makes sense to you. And the something that makes sense would be that in this situation, You'd like to hear that when this person does something, X, Y, or Z, no matter what it does, they feel better. 
and that usually means not moving and being in some comfortable position. Um, you would, if you're going to do something, uh, you're probably going to realign the the, um, the geography of that spine. So you would like to hear that when they do certain things, um, <clears throat> they feel better than when they don't. I'm going to assume this patient like has a fixed forward posture there and is sagittally out of balance, and that's a source of their pain. So you'd like to hear that, yes, when I sit down or lie down, I feel better, but when I stand up, I can't do it. Now, I've done... I would encourage anybody, if you're starting off in your career, and again, unfortunately, I look back at it now, 100 years later, and wish I had, is if you're interested in uh, memorializing this stuff and learning and teaching, is to somehow figure out a way to document everything you do uh, in the clinical exam, everything you hear somehow, because you can come back and learn a lot later on. What I do with these people who are standing like this, and I've never really, and I've never really, um, quantified it but they're standing here like this and they're saying oh, oh god you know i hurt so i will stand behind them i will put my hand right here and i'll put my hand in this position right there and then i'll force them back like this and i'll ask, say now how do you feel and if they say oh god i feel better i think that patient's a candidate for a realignment procedure am i right i don't know because i've never you know, written it all down and look back at it a hundred years later. The patient who I do like this and they say, oh, God damn it, it's killing me. I wonder if it's going to make a difference. That's a great point. Yeah. And I really want to thank our uh, commenting colleague uh, for having made uh, a very similar statement, um, uh, Dr. El Gomri. So, so what's the plan now with uh, this patient? What's what's being done? Um, was this clinic? Did you do a recumbent test? We actually, Doctor Wooden, I think very alike. I, I propose the so-called recumbent test, where I lay them down and then stand them up. Yeah, that because a patient will walk into into your office and they're standing like this, and you, they come back from X-ray and you're looking at them like this, and you, and you think, oh my God, I have to do an osteotomy here. I mean, look at how they're balanced. But if you put them on the table and they're gonna hurt at first and their knees are up like this and you slowly take the knees down and then you take the pillow out from the bed and the next you can see they're lying flat. Well, you know then in the operating room, you don't need to do an osteotomy. You maybe need to hold them in that position, but it's a whole different thing. The osteotomy is when they're like this on the bed, you push the head down, the legs come up, you push the legs down, the head comes up. That's osteotomy time. That's a great point. Yeah, so, she can lay flat. She can lay flat. She can lay flat. So it's a dynamic and flexible um, problem. This could be also under rehabbed. All right, so technetium 99 bone scan, still a role in this era with SPECT? <clears throat> you know, I just had this a little while ago. I had a patient. I was thinking about doing that, and I realized I haven't done that in years. So I think we have enough technology that I, I still take get care them. of cancer, so I don't. I still get them. <laughs> I know. Well, you and I are longer in the tooth than others. Yeah. But the, uh... No, I, I, I find them extremely valuable. And uh, so CT myogram, thoracic lumbar spine, we're getting electric. You know, basically all of that. But in the end of the day, um, not sure that surgery has another role. Jared, as you look back at this record, and again, this was a very long record biopsy you had to perform. Um, did she ever get better from any of the procedures in a sustained fashion beyond the three-week honeymoon period? Was there anything that actually ever made a substantial, lasting, somewhat lasting difference? From from the incomplete records, uh, it doesn't seem so. Um, and you know, asking like asking her now, uh, you know, she's been through so much that you know the answer kind of might be clouded by the history. She has not been happy with any of it. Um, you know, or they've, you know, like made her worse. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think so. Okay. That's no, note to self. And I always ask patients, especially when they have orthopedic surgeries, like hip replacements or so how well they did after that and how that affected them, what their recovery was, because I can glean for myself some insights and in how well they might do if everything goes well with a spine surgery. Yeah. I feel like after, you know, like one or two surgeries, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they might be able to recall something like that after that many surgeries that they've just been through the ringer. And, you know, a lot of times it's just, you know, thinking back, nothing has, it has all brought me to this point. And so nothing has worked and that's, that's all you're going to 
I so you're going to remember. Beginning, but what's her overall stature? Is she tall, short, fat, thin? Uh, so uh, um, I think the, the BMI is 28, uh, if, I, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, about 5'5". Uh, five, five. So that's pretty normal. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Next case. Thank you, Jared. Um, as you can see, Kirk, we have put away with lab coats. We have uh, the new SNI lab coats are kind of winter sports padded jackets. Oh, I know. So, the puffs. so, yeah. so we don't use lab coats anymore. <laughs> the new lab coat, yeah. All right. This is Dr. James Hicks, and he likes large fonts. And this is actually for his standards, they're pretty modest font size. <clears throat> Trying to keep it tame. So um, James Hicks is from Alabama originally, and so he's probably going to go back to Alabama. And he comes from our good friend Steve Tice's program. So glad to have him here. Very good. Uh, so Stead talks. Uh, so uh, short and sweet history here. A uh, seventy-year-old female history of a T9 to P fixation uh, for deformity, approximately seven years prior. She feels uh, her back uh, break while helping her disabled husband. Um, she develops subsequent severe low back pain and forward lean, and she doesn't have associated L5 radiculopathy, um, but she is otherwise neurologically intact. So before you show the x-rays, mm -hmm. this is, it's easy to point fingers at others like in the previous case. This is a patient of mine. Okay, Kirk, so I'll assume full responsibility. Just and you can have that, Adler. That last case, was, was that what is now? Or? Yeah, this is now. She just came in with those x-rays. and Oh, so she hasn't been cared for. No, we, we are... We just wanted to show this as a warning example of spine surgery, of that fusion is not the only answer, and that adding more surgery uh, is like adding insult to injury. It can be very unwise. And of course, I will look at sagittal balance now and identify some mismatch or something like that, but there may be a very different prerogative there. And of course, when we have these metal, uh, metal illusion kind of devices in that one focus is always, is this actually healed sufficiently or not so that's why we showed that case it's not resolved and you know early on when i was more involved with uh you know the srs and deformity mm -hmm. you know we started to try to come out with classifications for adult deformity in my humble opinion you know it started with uh unfortunately with the adolescent experience which uh, was a classification of curvature and, and things like that. But as you know, every 14 year old who has a scoliosis or kyphosis or whatever is exactly the same, except for their spine x-ray. They hate their parents. They don't want to be in the doctor. You know, they just want to listen to you know, music and stuff. They just, they wonder why they're there. But adults are completely different. I mean, you, yeah. there's not an x-ray in the world that you can't put up there and find 16 different presentations. You know, first time operation, 17th time operation, fat, thin, yeah. thin, hates their husband, hates their wife, <laughs> you know, this, that, uh, and everybody, and all that plays in. So it's, it's a much more Zen Eastern approach to adult deformity, in my opinion, than taking care of adolescents with, right, or, or with the right thoracic curve. That's a great point. By the way, shout out to Dr. Ahmad Pirzad. We have visitors from around the world live, but Dr. Pirzad from Afghanistan, thank you for joining us. Okay, now to the meat of the matter. What did I do? Yes, so uh, this is how she's presenting to our clinic. And um, did you pull up old films just out of curiosity so Dr. Wood can see whether uh, this was even an emote indication have, or not? I don't have her original, original Scully films from years and years ago, um, but this is her original films. Uh, with this uh, new break in her back. Um, so this is her representing to us. Um, obviously, you can see the hooks at the top. She just have some degenerative change at the top, but that's uh, not as symptomatic. Moving on down, you can see uh, a well-fused segment. Um, and then we have our rod breakage and around that last um, uh, rod connector, cross connector. Um, so some sort of stress riser there leading to some micromotion and fracture of the, the rods bilaterally there. Um, yeah, in around that L5 region. It's subtle on the left side of the screen, but mm -hmm. it just looks like the rods don't exactly line up, aren't quite aiming at each other. But yep. there seems to be a big gap on the right side, at least the left side of the patient, right side of the screen. Right, right. Yeah, so she... What happened to that piece of rod? 
to be determined. We'll see. We'll have more images, but all great points. So this yeah. patient actually did quite well. She was like six years out or something. She's like about that? seven years out. Seven years this. out. And she's so an extremely mentally and physically active person. Again, she was sole provider for her very disabled husband. So she actually did mechanical loads. And she's she's a, a very, very enigmatic, energetic person. And mm -hmm. I did the surgery and just, uh, you'll talk about biomaterials, but as you can see, I used uh, peak materials. Uh, I don't remember whether I used off-label bone morphogenic protein or not. I don't recall. I don't believe the first time. Yeah, routinely no. I don't use those, but when I have a suspicion of healing impairment. And in those days I used, uh, single meaning two rods and i think those are 60 titanium or what are they yeah so those, those are titanium cobalt, we those use are titanium. Only titanium yeah so in terms of when you do deformity surgeries kirk and i know, uh, kirk and I know you've done thousands what percentage of rod uh, failure do you anticipate uh, over time like after two years what's a normal rod failure rate that you quote um i myself have not looked at back at that, but if I was going to guesstimate, I would say at two years, rod failure, maybe five to 10 percent. So um, Dr. Hart, who said he'll, he'll come by our partner, he's actually published something with ISSG. And what's that number that he quotes? Uh, by I five years? I can't, I can't keep it. By five number. years, 20 percent. Um, sure. uh, so he actually says the number, and the more you look, the more carefully you look like, this is a great case in that regard. One side is obvious, the other side, mm, you got to do a little bit more looking, but it's clearly broken on both sides now. It's right. interesting, our good friend Vincent Arlette looked at um, rod fractures and their clinical importance, mm -hmm. and it actually has a lot to do with where the rod breaks. In other words, mm -hmm. there's below L5-S1 and there's above L5-S1, the latter of which <clears throat> becomes technically or clinically more important than something down real low. Interesting. Um, so with this uh, uh, hardware failure, uh, kind of uh, as an orthopedic principle, you get concerns for uh, non-union. Um, in this particular case, I will go to her, her Scully film here. Um, and I think she is uh, bracing somewhat anteriorly there in order to uh, stand upright for us. Uh, but clinically, she has a, a significant lean. Um, and then when we lay down for CT, um, we do have concerns for uh, that non-union at L5-S1, which is a... Can you uh, use a pointer just for the audience uh, to highlight L5-S1, just that there's no question? Um, where So maybe start in the middle and then show go. the parasagal cuts. L5-S1 here. So L4-5 is have dubious. Our, our fractures uh, of the rods uh, left and right. There. So and the I fractured fully, L5S1. Yeah, yeah, and I can't fully explain the gap that we see on that uh, radiograph, but uh, even, even interoperatively, the rods were essentially on top of each other, if not overlapped. Um, so, the instability there. so I always conceptualize, Kirk, um, two types of non unions. Uh, one is a stable non union where we need advanced imaging. There may be some radiolucency, but there's not a major component. Uh, disruption, shall I say, and the other one is an unstable non-union like this here where there's resorption of bone, there's an aggressive remodeling and dissolution process underway with a likely progressive tendency. Is that a concept that has some merit to you? Is that something that you use in your adjudication of if this might be a symptomatic or an asymptomatic non-union or are they kind of all the same? No, 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 no. I absolutely agree. I mean, we've learned from decades that um, there are pain-free pseudoarthroses mm -hmm. out there. And if you operate on every pseudoarthrosis you see radiographically, you're going to convert a percentage of them into painful individuals. Sure. Yeah. So you can l live with uh, a non-union uh, quite well in certain, you know, certain situations. And I agree with Dr. Chapman completely. Uh, the, there, uh, there are there are problematic failures and there are non-problematic failures. But again, like everything else, also you'd like to hear about the history because. Ultimately, all you're going to do, again, is stop it from moving mm. with your treatment. So you would like to hear that when I sit still, I'm okay. When I move, down. I'm not. If they tell you it's killing me when I'm lying down in bed, your chances of clinical success with more surgery yeah, aren't as strong. Yeah. Um, so she does have quite severe pain with ambulation. Um, and we can 
bridge into what we did or um, or maybe have Dr. Wood maybe tell us. tell us what you think. So I did this all posteriorly. I prefer all posterior. We have very good access surgeons, but I've just over years gone more and more into posterior. And obviously 5.1 is a common on you side, but what would you do now? Is this something where you'd go anteriorly to kind of fish that plastic out? 4.5 looks suspect. Everything else above looks fully remodeled. Uh, it's very frustrating to see. So anterior and then go posterior because clearly she has a long leave arm, so you'd have to go anterior and posterior. Or would an anterior fixation alone with screws be sufficient? So just share your thoughts as to, assuming that this patient is a good surgical candidate, what you would do. So, so she's got a cage at 5.1 or she has something. A, she has a peak spacer right. in there. Uh, we don't have, but assume that there's see. a peak spacer, just see. like in all the other levels in there. There is uh, some radiograph, there's an indicator here. Right. And again, she has a resorption around there. She has no systemic signs of infection. We got a sed rate CRP, not particularly elevated that I remember. We obviously always suspect a potential occult infection or a saprophytic, more or less, uh, um, super infection in a patient with a non-union, but um, uh, uh, that's not the primary problem. But so, what would you do now? No, again, assuming she was as a reasonable candidate and had that history that I described. I mean, I don't. Dr. Chapman is as capable an individual as are in the world of taking care of this. I would be quite comfortable doing it. Just you know, mm -hmm. from the back, we have ways of doing it. At the same time, because I have learned uh, over time that uh, going back in the front is a treacherous thing in a lot of situations. And unless there's an absolute indication that you have to go in there for some reason, mm -hmm. try to do it from the back. And I've also sort of learned, you know, that what you learn in early on for in the cervical spine, that an ACDF non-union, the treatment for that is a posterior surgery. And you will miraculously, at least in my eyes, see over time that anterior fusion suddenly solidifies yeah. with stabilization. Yeah. And I have come to believe uh, and see that that sort of happens in the lumbar spine as well. Mm. Great point. All right, uh, show Dr. Wood what we did. So um, there are a lot of different <laughs> options we could consider. Um, but what we did do was go ahead and uh, get full exposure of the uh, non-union site. Uh, we did have um, an incidental uh, dural tear, although that was uh, almost guaranteed for this patient, and we did explain that to her. Um, we were able to migrate down to that L5-S1 uh, disc space, remove the spacer uh, just about in whole, from what I remember, um, and uh, easily debride. We sent off cultures, um, and then... Uh, really rough up those end plates for our subsequent uh, uh, rise cages there bilaterally. Um, we we're able to get some good uh, lordotic correction uh, as well. And then uh, the interesting part is maybe worth discussing is a lot of times we talk about those, those quad rod constructs, et cetera, but in her case, we we're able to uh, uh, use direct connectors and that L12 uh, region um, uh, to connect down to the, the, the construct. Obviously, we do have uh, the working rods uh, down low as as part of a quad rod uh, construct, um, but there are different ways uh, to do this. So let me hone on um, biomaterials. So PEAK uh, was introduced by industry to give us best chances of radiolucency to witness fusions. Now it's kind of more viewed as the, the Great Wall, like in Game of Thrones, where the wildlings can't uh, find any attachment to it. Uh, I used titanium here, I used off-label BMP and obviously uh, some iliac crest graft of her since we had that exposure. Uh, what are your thoughts on titanium versus peak in general and uh, in terms of expandable cages versus static? Is there a pro and con to each of those uh, modalities? Well, as far as the material itself goes, um, peak uh, originally was very attractive because of its modulus of elasticity coming close to bone and the idea was just like a semi-rigid fixation it would stimulate a fusion at that point and it was easy to use and radiographically uh, attractive because you could follow the fusion uh, much more closely than with uh, metal in there right. um, we will we have learned uh, that as dr chapman pointed out that they not every body tolerates peak the same way and there can be situations where 
uh, uh, bone resorption uh, of a nature change. can take yeah. place around it. Um, and, um, and, and the fusion can be uh, compromised to a certain degree. Um, as far as expandable cages go, um, it's hard for me in this situation to imagine a, an expandable cage making much difference in one's overall standing posture. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I'm becoming sort of an acolyte uh, with the concept that not every end plate is structured the same way. Mm -hmm. And I am becoming interested in the idea because you will see when you put in A-lifts or T-lifts or D-lifts or whatever lift you're putting in there mm -hmm. and uh, you've sort of done your carpentry of the space there, but it's not exact what the thing that you're putting in there is. There's a curve and there's a divot and there's a bend and stuff like that. So there's not complete apposition like you would like to have. But an expandable cage can maybe, you know, uh, lessen that a little bit yeah. by going in there and then opening it up so you do have more bone on titanium apposition yeah, more additional than you did before. There. Yeah. Interesting. Good points. And one more time on biomaterials. Does titanium have usually a better surface characteristic to allow for early, at least on growth, even if it's not micro blasted or somehow surface structured? Is it inherently a better, more friendly environment for early uh, host uh, cell attachment? Uh, yes, and at 730, you will be wondered and awed when you see the possibilities that exist out there in titanium. Audience, stay Whoa. tuned. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So thank you. So one more case, and then we'll see what Dr. Wood has to offer in terms of the latest and greatest of surface characters. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> this is Dr. Mauricio Avila, uh, Wera, and I was going to say on that last yeah. Uh, case, you know, when she stood up, you saw obvious issues at the thoracolumbar junction on the x-rays. And I know some institutions very close to where I work, where that patient would have been signed up for a T3 to the pelvis operation. Very insightful. This is a very astute patient, and we had actually extensive discussions about this and documentations to this uh, effect. And she truly felt that this was not an issue. Uh, I got a CT myelogram on her, obviously, also with that area in mind. And there's no cord compromise. There's no myelopathy. There's no radiculopathy. And she was actually very happy. With it. She had yeah. literally to the point of what you said, focal lumbosacral pain. She didn't and, point to her bra line and say that's where No. And this is, again, but uh, of course... Uh, in long fusions, the incidence of breakdown is 100%, and she has some junctional wear and tear and kyphosis. Uh, but in a differentiated iterative discussion, this is again a very thorough patient, so there were several visits um, that were not short. Um, uh, we had this discussion. Should we go up to T4 or not? Would you have just a priori with that appearance? No, absolutely. Um, I mean, her balance was quite um, reasonable, you know, and as uh, everybody here probably knows, I mean, we started off uh, with such zeal, you know, a decade or two ago about aligning these individuals, um, whereas, where in fact, the average 75 year old is going to be standing in the exact same posture she has. And finally, if she don't hurt, don't break it again. And and that's a great uh, point, an important aspect, and that's um, this overcorrection thing. So I probably overcorrected her a little bit. You could criticize that um, she's maybe just sagging down now because I overcorrected her. Is that something that you actually mathematically follow now, or is that, again, just an overreaction um, to the inevitable junctional breakdown? Um, yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, a fusion to the thoracolumbar junction is going to break down radiographically, but as we all know, maybe you know a third of those actually turn clinical. Um, I am not the carpenter and the surgeon that you are, and so I don't get such great correction, and maybe that's protected me over time. And these people walk out 70-year-old, five centimeters forward balanced, but I think plenty of them can be if they were 15 centimeters ahead of time and now they're five, they feel okay. Yeah, a great point. So Mauricio is from the University of Arizona, is a neurosurgical colleague, and he has a great academic job at uh, um, St. Louis University coming up. So he has uh, seen a patient in clinic recently, again, full disclosure, but not initially a patient of mine. So Mauricio? Okay, good morning. So 61-year-old male, he presented to our spine clinic with uh, low back pain and distal below lower extremity paresthesias. Um, 
right away that his prior relevant surgical history, he had an alif at L5-S1 in, in this state, but a different city about three years prior to the original presentation in our spine clinic. Uh, when we initially saw him, and I'll show you the x-rays in a minute, we try to manage this conservatively with some physical therapy, some rest, some activity modification, and he actually got a bone growth stimulator. So, uh, Can I ask, yeah. I mean, three years after an operation, a, a bone growth stimulator? Yeah. Does My it, fault. Does it work? I don't know. I was going to ask you that question. I'm, um, I've never done it, <laughs> but, I, but maybe it does. It would be interesting. Thing. Look at the images, and again, I am game for criticism always, but uh, yeah. this is a good discussion point. Um, this is, again, a different type of a non-union that we saw before. This goes more into the stable non-union environment, and this also attends a, 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 or addresses a patient who's very indolent. I never thought of it, but I might and, try it now. Uh, I've had unstructured success with it on occasions but yeah look at the images and yeah. again it's certainly subject to discussion surprising in our state um, the insurers usually pay for an attempt at non-surgical treatment even if it's expensive like a external stimulator yeah well interestingly enough i think radiographically it did not work but the patient you know pain got a little bit better not enough but got a little bit better so um Dr. placebo <laughs> that years ago. yeah, yeah. Um, relevant medical history, overall very healthy, asthma and AFib, uh, but not an anticoagulation. You can see there his neurological exam, he's basically neurologically intact. So I was able, you know, not the pre original pre-op, but this is about a year after his ALIF. By this point, we have not met him yet. This was, you know, films we could get back. So, you so I'll stop you here. Mm -hmm. This was done for what in retrospect, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Marithi was a relatively stable grade one isthmic spondy. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll show you the CT. Yeah, yeah. good. So is an ALIF like this a sufficient construct uh, for a grade one isthmic spondylolisthesis? I know, I think you're a participant in the AO study. We still don't know what Paul Arnold's results are. We are a contributor. Is this a sufficient mechanical construct for a grade one isthmic spondy? That's a wonderful question. And I'm trying to, you know, fire up the engines and ask that question, you know, down home. Because uh, I, I have the belief that it is, but mm -hmm. my partners don't necessarily. And so they will back up uh, grade one. But I'm, I believe that uh, given the right a surgical approach and technique, et cetera, that a standalone um, product like this is satisfactory for grade one or two ismic spondylolisthesis in the adult. Do you need a different type of fixation construct in the front? So in addition to a strut graft for slordosis and pretensions the anterior column, do you need rigid anterior fixation? Well, I think uh, it's been, these constructs have been studied, and a cage with four screws into it, uh, standing alone, is as biomechanically stable or rigid as a posterior pedicle screw construct. That versus the other. Now, if you add them both, you know something in the front and something in the back. Yes, that is even more rigid. And that that's unattainable. But just doing one procedure or the other, I think they're equivalent. Okay. All right. Um, so, and then just to point out, you can already see here one of the screws coming yeah, out. Yeah, that was that my question. If the, the suppose this guy was absolutely fine, but walked in, you know, a year after his operation. But by the time he walked in our clinic, that was about three years after his operation. Uh, sorry, uh, two years after his operation. Well, in a hypothetical situation, yeah. your patient walks in and that screw is out. What do you do? If he's asymptomatic. Nothing. Because a lot of patients will be concerned when they see right, that. Right. And there are things with names down there that you don't want to injure. Right. Correct. Again, if he's asymptomatic, my hope is the fusion will take and the screw will stop moving, which unfortunately in this patient did not happen. The fusion. So, yeah. So I, I obviously, and I'm very in tune with this, I tell patients about this. I show them this. I tell them. Uh, I will have a low threshold towards getting like a um, a contrasted CT scan, uh, but uh, I will at very least ask them to come back for a serial radiographic exam. And we obviously get flexion extension films and carefully try to address translational and angular deformities um, to look for any progression or all that. 
And this is, uh, this is a nice um, juxtaposition. So what's your interpretation there, Mauricio? So again, this was the, what I call our original, which is about one year after his surgery. This is the x-rays uh, that we asked the patients to have before the in clinic. You can already see the collapse of the disc space. I think the screw overall is still in the same position, but you can see fusion is not happening and the disc space collapse. And then this is a follow-up image after we tried that initial non-op management um, that we're talking about with rest physical therapy. And this is what we call the, our pre-op image. And then yeah. I, there's a CT as well. You know, he's been wearing his bone growth stimulator. I, I gave him a stimulator. We discussed options. And again, this was a perplexing case for me because he was not well, but he was not ill either. Mm -hmm. This is a oh. doer guy. He's one of those great people that you love to have. I'm not, I mean, he had a reasonable indication, I'll assume, for his an index procedure, but this is not a person who suffers. Uh, uh, nice. per se yeah. and he was bothered his wife was very troubled but he was okay to proceed he had no neurologic problems really and again this is in contradistinction to the previous patient this is what i would call a stable non-union there's metal migration yes but there's not a substantial erosive resorption around that uh, peak cage there's just this famous little line that's just not gone through but there is some effort at the body and this is a nice uh, series of images where the body tried to form some bone around it and it's not totally sclerosed right and again it looked to me on the plane radiographs that your uh, you know external stimulator was working i mean i just thought it looked a little denser there between mm -hmm. the bones I agree. This is uh, this is one of those things. Maybe it's a surgeon placebo effect. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would not be using those in these quote stable non-unions if it hadn't led to some clinical subjective improvement of patients. And the the quantifiable difference in actual osteon migration takes at least half a year. But I've had clearly some patients who are very happy with it, and it's a low risk. And again, if our insurers pay for it, and the patients are willing to put up with the frustration of a delay of a result by half a year or a year, I'm fine with that. I think it's justifiable. I would not do it for a destructive non-union like in my previous case. But this, in this case, he seemed to be fine, right? Right, right. No, he's, he's you know, normal weight, very smart guy, and he got eight months out of it with some relief, not 100% relief, but some relief. But uh, by the time he came back, he said, listen, the back pain is not getting any better. You know, it's, he wanted a more definitive solution. And again, we're talking about it with the CT, again, bilateral pars defect. Um, and you can see his, his ALIF. Do you think the pars defect is a source of pain today? Ooh, that's a, that's a, oh, <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> I mean, if I thought, if I wondered that, yeah. I would probably get an injection there. I don't know if, if anybody's I, written I, we the do, utility of that or not. We have a great uh, interventional uh, spine colleague that administration decided to not co-locate with us anymore, but that's a different story. <laughs> but um, uh, he's very talented and uh, really good. And actually one of his fellows, is, Gavin is right here with us. So it's a very cool thing. Um, we love, actually, I do PARS injections. I send you PARS injections not too infrequently, right? We didn't inject him that I remember, but yeah. we may or may not. We would have discussed it as Gavin in the blue, uh, in the blue lab coat, mm -hmm. the blue modern lab coat. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we do PARS injections, and I find them valuable. I'm not sure we did it in this man, and I think we would have discussed it. Uh, I don't remember. I think because by the time he presented to us, he already had surgery and all these other things. My thing with, <clears throat> with PARS defect is it seems to be for some of these patients, there's an inciting event, right? They have had this for a while, but then something happens and then all of a sudden they have low back pain. I think in his case, the non-union and you see, you know, the bilateral PARS defect, I will say he's probably contributing some of his pain. Um, the foramen, at least on, on this side, I don't remember if this was the right or left side, it looks overall fairly open. Maybe this one has more, uh, more stenosis, maybe that's the frame and discussing more of his radiculopathy. He has mostly uh, left leg pain. So I'm gonna say this was the left one. Just you know, I counsel the patient, you know, who presents with, you know, independent of this situation, just with ischemic spondylolisthesis, you know, that 8% of the North American population has mm -hmm. ischemic spondylolisthesis wow. and many have no idea that it's right. there. Right. Um, 
But I'd say, I think you know, my dad had it, but he, it wasn't until he was in his 70s mm -hmm. that he started to notice that something mm -hmm. was amiss. So I say, yeah, and obviously we're not screening the streets here looking for ischemic spondylolisthesis and dragging them in and doing surgery. So you can function quite well with that. Right. But I think ultimately you don't get to the end of life without at some point realizing something's up with my back mm -hmm. and just, and then you deal with it. Right. Because right. so many people will say, oh, I can't do this, so I can't do that. Right. I said, I'm sure there are people on the U.S. National Olympic team who are, have ischemic spinal diseases and right. they're doing fine. Right. Okay, so, sorry. So is this, okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we're getting to the good part, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> so given, again, non-union, radiculopathy, some benefit, but not overall, you know, 100% benefit for the non-op care, um, we recommend the revision surgery. I have some couple of x-ray intra-op. Um, so before we go into further, so you, you, he's giving away what we're doing. Go back to that <laughs> CT. Okay. So you talked about just doing a posterior stabilization before, and there's again an attempt at this body in this healthy, biologically healthy person to heal. Would a posterior instrumentation with a posterior fusion be sufficient? Um, the literature would support it. In a, in uh, I don't know if the literature supports it in a uh, revision situation like this, but de novo ischemic spondylolisthesis, there's no clear cut difference between a lift, p lift, mm -hmm. posterior spine fusion, or combined surgery in terms of clinical outcome. Right. In terms of going back in through the front, you said something that actually I found very true. And when we're in conferences, I frequently hear a lot of surgeons very casually talk about revision anterior procedures. I actually totally concur. This is a pretty maiming surgery. This is not the same as a first. And yes, you can go from the right. And yes, you can go transperitoneal. But this is, uh, this is not a trivial little undertaking. The risks of something are far higher. Is that your perception as well? Yeah, that certainly. Yeah, that's been my experience. But I too, you know, use an access surgeons. But at the same time, I'm in the room and I can hear them complaining uh, as we're going in. And you would think, and that's the whole concept at five one. How tough can it be? Because the vessels have diverged, right. and you're basically just heading straight for the bone with almost nothing in between, in theory. But in actuality, it's not as easy as it looks. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain, remember, there are windows of opportunity. I mean, at uh, two weeks, it's okay up to, you know, to go back in at 5-1 pretty safely, even some of the other levels. But after that, up to maybe two or three months, you can't go back in. After a number of months, then a vascular surgeon can try to work his way through the scar tissue because it's more organized. Mm -hmm. What rate of and what type of sexual dysfunction do you quote males? This man is actually sexually active. And so if you go in from the front again, what rate of sexual dysfunction, what type of sexual dysfunction do you quote patients? Well, the literature would suggest 2%, you know, so one out of 50 times people might have it. I, um, we, you know, ret there's nothing like retrospective analysis of, of your results. Uh, I don't recall having seen that, but on the other hand, I when I operate on men, I put the bovie away and I just you know use the knife and and dissection like that, and so that I can at least dictate that in my operative note that that's what we did and why, because um, what you don't want to do is have something happen you didn't tell me about this, and the operative note describes the bovie work you did so. So I, I quote males, the Scott Blumenthal original um, uh, pro-disc, uh, and uh, I think it was a Charité disc data of 6% retrograde ejaculation. And I say, and this is from the Swedish literature, and I forgot the primary author now, uh, that sexual dysfunction in men and women is about 30% with revision ALIFs. So one in three. It's usually not prohibitive, but again, leave it to the Swedes to have a very detailed sexual questionnaire. And so the number, uh, the, their conclusion was it is underreported, and uh, female patients were also underreported. So I'm just quoting those numbers. So we went from the back. Went from the back. The only one that I do remember happened, he was an incarcerated inmate, and so that's how we discovered he had sexual dysfunction. Okay. So here we are. Oh, I would also it, it, recommend that if one is going in back through the front, is to consider putting in the urinal stents. 
Great point. Because uh, going back in, the vascular people can't even f figure out where the ureter is. Yeah, what's what. So you have urology come in before the case gets started and place them, and then um, uh, then you, they become very rigid and they can feel them. Okay. Um, so we went from the back, and um, although I was not in this particular case, I've done uh, one of these with Dr. Chapman. So. Uh, uh, this are two intra op pictures, two different drill, two different drill bits. <laughs> so this is just a regular Midas going through the peak cage, and then you can see now the screws are in, and this is a uh, metal cutting burr burring through the the screw in order to uh, then put the cages that I'm going to show you in a minute. So this I just point out to see that you know there was this screw. Here, pre-op, the screw is gone. That was a screw that was drilled in order to put the cages. And this is how it looked like after. So again, this was the original one on the, on the left-hand side when he presented to our clinic. And then this is uh, our latest uh, post-op imaging. So again, I sometimes have actually taken the anti-hardware out. In his case, I was a little bit worried about it. I did not want to go fishing for it. Opportunistically, I have taken those out under CRM guidance. And um, I just did not want to do that. And there's the, the plot thickens now. So any comments on the construct? No, you've done beautiful work. What I'm also interested in is what I call the three-legged table. My three-legged table theory of uh, ismic spondylolisthesis is that it, a, stable, a table can stand uh, on three legs. But if you stand on the table, you fall over. So what is taking place above? And you can see, interestingly, at L4-5, over the, the months, you've got a well-maintained uh, disc space that is now, at least radiographically, retroalesthetic. And retroalesthesis is when a disc goes bad. This may never clinically turn up to be anything. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, if at some point in time in his life, he presented with uh, some issues, it wouldn't surprise me. Right. And as Dr. Chapman was saying, um, so follow up, radicular improved. He had still some paresthesias on the right lower extremity. Um, now his main concern is he's unable to ejaculate. So he said that after the a -lift, this was not an issue. So for the two, three years after the a -lift, until he got revision, was not an issue until after this revision surgery. So. so what happened is that the hypogastric plexus, I mean, I did not dig around that plate. I did not kind of reach around or do anything. I tensioned him a little bit, but did nothing else. So what happened? <laughs> you got me. Has this been described? No. I mean, I, I am pretty clear about the various sexual dysfunction aspects, especially in the male um, uh, with patients. I'm pretty frank. Um, and talk about retrograde ejaculation versus an ejaculation versus painful ejaculations or a no or erectile dysfunction. But this one was a new one for me also. I think and I hope, I, I specifically asked about semen in the urine and he's denied that. So he does not produce sperm right now. So I hope this is, is no sensory deficits. Um, I'm not gonna send him to a urologist yet, but this, uh, this hopefully is still amenable to improvement. I've not seen this particular problem. And the only thing I could tell him is, I think I tensioned whatever your hypogastric plexus was in front of that metal plate, but I'm not going to go fish that plate out now. No, 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 no. I, but at the same time, I would, I'm always interested in, in, you know, adding to the literature. And if nobody likes to describe the downward results after surgery or series or otherwise, but uh, I would consider, you know, this is a case report in a couple of years if it mm -hmm. persists. Yep. That's a good point. Yeah. And um, because you're also, you're largely, so far right, correct me if I'm wrong, you're going simply on what he's telling you. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what, I hadn't thought of the test, the semen and the urine thing, but if, if after a couple of years have passed and he is still that way, I mean, with his permission, I would consider describing this because I hadn't, wasn't really aware of that in the past. Yeah. So we did use, and this is going to be quoted in this article. So do you want to tell us about this article? And we have two minutes, and then we have to switch to our speaker. No, that, that was it. Uh, again, as you were mentioned, I've, you know, I've heard it on the anterior surgery, on the ALIF, but never on the posterior. I don't know if this is also, in his case, a little bit of a stretch of that plexus because his disc space was quite a bit collapsed, and now he has uh, bilateral cages. Maybe that's why. Or, I guess the, the, or. 
but the, the the good news is, at least on this article, almost half of them will will recover at uh, at the final follow up. So I did use off label BMP. Yeah. I contain it anteriorly. I, I'm very careful about having a solid impacted bone graft layer between it and the nerves in the back. But could this be a radiculitis kind of a, a hypogastric plexus uh, inflammation or not? Don't know. I doubt it. I don't know. Yeah, I hope not. Okay. All right, Mauricio, thank you. Yeah. So I want to thank our fellows for putting these cases together as a subject for discussion. We had a nice chat going on the side. It is indeed a great uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce, uh, reintroduce in a way, Professor Kirk Wood here. He was uh, a previous visitor at our spine trauma uh, talks, and we hope that we'll have him back this winter again. Um, he is a professor at Stanford. Uh, he originally went to school in Albany, and uh, he is uh, a fellowship-trained Minnesota spine surgeon uh, from that famous uh, Twin Cities Scosa Spine Center, which is obviously a legacy of great people. He does residency at UPIT and his internship there as well, and he was a professor and chief of the spine service at Mass General. He's considered a thought leader in many arenas in spine. He's a very honest, very straightforward uh, thinker and speaker, as you'll see. Uh, his uh, contributions to our spine trauma literature are and remain to the present date, as I know firsthand, the most quoted articles in terms of indications and techniques of thoracolumbar spine trauma surgery. And again, they're the only prospectively randomized long-term follow-up studies in the world. So he's a truly uh, major name in our facility, but most importantly, he's a great friend and a, a very, very good colleague to bounce complex ideas of. So thank you, Kirk, for coming up the coast and uh, joining us in Seattle and talking to us about biomaterials and spine fusions. Well, thank you. Uh, um, it's uh, thrilling to come back here, obviously, and wonderful to see Jens again. Um, the, uh, as many of you now know, having worked with Dr. Chapman, uh, he is uh, he is an old holds uh, individual who will give you the best education possible. And I remember when I first became part of the AO so many years ago at some meeting, and I think it was in those days where we couldn't talk about pedicle screws in America, so we had to be off overseas someplace. And um, I thought it was going to be just a casual event, <laughs> but I put up some talks, started talking about this, and he just ripped me in half uh, very pleasantly, you know. and. Uh, but I thought to myself, okay, he's the real deal. And to this day, I am uh, I consider that true. And again, it's always a, a privilege to be able to be in the same room. So thank you, Jens, for letting me come back up. You really are a gentleman. And so as we saw in some of the slides uh, today, uh, a lot of the discussion uh, and questions uh, continue about anterior uh, lumbar inner body fusion, whether they're standalone or part of scoliosis constructs. And I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> some of the issues with that and uh, the approach that at least one of the uh, companies uh, uh, is taken uh, in this regard. And without having actually a disclosure slide, I will say, that uh, I have an association with uh, Kyocera, which is the manufacturer of this, and Kyocera but, uh, has um, paid for this trip and, and my housing and a uh, part of a, a wonderful dinner last night. Uh, but I'm also uh, in uh, cahoots with two or three other companies that do the same thing. So my allegiances are not necessarily in one direction or the other. But this uh, slide demonstrates uh, what we're going to be talking about. As you can see, a much older construct uh, down at the L5S1 for ismic spondylolisthesis, which is a uh, titanium cage ostensibly filled uh, with bone graft in the hopes of obtaining a solid and rigid fusion uh, anteriorly. And these have become uh, quite popular, as you now know, again, both uh, with a posterior backup instrumentation as well as with um, standalone uh, technology. 
uh, the concept of doing uh, this as a uh, treatment for low back pain is a little bit controversial, as was alluded to earlier. We decided a few years ago to look back at a small group of individuals who had basically degenerative low back pain. So that would be either the dreaded black disc disease or degenerative spondylolisthesis of a low grade nature uh, and compared the outcomes uh, with those who were simply continued with non-operative management and did find that a significant percentage of those who were treated with these cages anteriorly standalone did satisfactorily better compared with those who were treated with a non-operative approach as well. So we started to ask ourselves, you know, what could be the source of uh, uh, the ones who did well versus the ones who didn't? You know, all clinical uh, applications and demographics aside, uh, the CAGE uh, technology itself became a center of focus uh, a few years ago because of the situations that we saw with some of the peak technology on some of the earlier slides. And as it turns out, that the surfaces of these implants is very important, it seems, in terms of not necessarily clinically, but especially from a uh, histologic standpoint of obtaining that fusion. And if you believe a solid fusion is what you are looking for in terms of achieving success, you are probably going to want to have radiographic uh, evidence that what you sought has turned out to be true. And what we have found over time is that, that that intrinsic, the porosity of that surface and its technical roughness definitely have positive effects. It will improve what we call the inner body mechanics. It is another way of backwards saying it improves the stability of the segment after placing the uh, implant there. Vascularization is improved with newer technology of surface roughness. And the attachments and the proliferation of osteoblasts, as we will see, that critical nature of making the bone form is uh, elevated when you change the surface of these things from smooth to rough. And all of this adds up to the all vital ingrowth potential of the bone <coughs> into the product. Now, a little bit over 10 years ago, the Kyocera group, uh, then known as Renovus, as well, uh, at the same time as the truss, uh, as, as the four web design uh, coming out of uh, Las Vegas, to, decided on and to change the direction of their um, to their research and their product development into something what was called a truss design, which you can think of as almost like the way the cantilever bending on the um, on the bridges uh, takes effect. In other words, changing something from a very rigid uh, hunk of titanium metal into something that had a lot more flexibility. And that has turned out uh, to be true when you look <coughs> at uh, the comparison now of some of these cages that are placed in there with this all new uh, ingrowth potential on the surface technology, as well as that uh, semi-flexibility of what we call the truss design. And this group out of South America uh, looked at uh, a very interesting uh, study where they took these 3D printed titanium cages without any bone graft at all and compared them with peak cages in an animal model filled with bone graft and saw that there was robust osteointegration even without any bone graft at all, just putting the device between uh, these sheep models whereas the peak cages had very little osteointegration, even though they had bone graft in the interior. Brian Cunningham group uh, back east then compared these 3D printed titanium alloys with the standard titanium smooth surface and peak inner body spacers and found an increased bone volume was within the cage of the titanium with the new surfaces at six weeks, but by 12, all three of them were pretty much the same <coughs> in terms of the bone volume, but there was much greater bone apposition in the 3D printed models. So I said about the same time, uh, about 10 years or so ago, what was introduced uh, was this technology 
because it turns out that pore size is very important in terms of osteointegration and the percentage of porosity in the surface, something that wasn't there before, but is there now. And as it turns out, what uh, is described as random uh, uh, pore structure, in other words, not making it just a repeated uh, um, surface from one side to the other, almost like an orchard, it has trees planted in a very systematic way, but you vary the angle and the size and the direction of these pores actually increases osteoblastic uh, uh, adherence potential. And this is what we're talking about, again, in sheep models, showing <coughs> the degree of bone growth uh, integration into this new uh, tessera trabecular structure from time zero all the way out to the three month point again uh, in a sheet model. And as I said, you know, the 3D printed architecture provides now with this semi flexibility to it, the strength of titanium, but without that characteristic stiffness of that and other metallic cages. And when you take away a lot of the titanium on the side and you leave these open channels, the compressive strength of this cage, much like peak, becomes very similar to human bone. This is a slide on the left that shows that lattice type structure, you know, that will resist, you know, the subsidence to a certain degree uh, by allowing that cage to flex slightly with adjacent vertebra. And what we have found out that when titanium bends a little bit and is flexed just a little bit, somehow osteoblasts are stimulated and their apposition and their replication increases dramatically. You can certainly see on plane radiographs that the X-ray visibility is improved when you don't have a rigid titanium roll around the side. But, uh, uh, Keeping in mind, however, that uh, while this is certainly helpful in the clinical setting, taking plain radiographs, uh, if one is going to, to study whether there's true fusion or not, CT scanning is usually the procedure of choice. So this new resilience technology of Kyocera that shows a very flexible cage versus that solid titanium over, over on the right-hand side, much stiffer, less bone uh, apposition. From a technical standpoint, this is what the cage looks like now compared with some of the previous ones because as anybody will tell you, especially in certain situations given the patient's size and whatnot, it can be very difficult to get all four screws into the uh, cage, especially at L4-5 and sometimes L3-4 where you're battling the, um, from the left-hand side of the spine, you're battling the vasculature which is trying to come from the right to the left and it can be sometimes hazardously difficult to get that uh, ultimate screw over there, but the whole direction has been changed to a certain degree, making it much easier to get into than it has been in the past. The Kyocera, uh, Tessera uh, technology comes now obviously in a whole array of sizes, uh, not expandable at this point in time, but you can see they can be very large, up to 21 millimeters in size, and they can be also tremendously angulated and up to 28 degrees in angulation for use at that lumbosacral junction. And I've always tried to uh, mimic what the normal uh, anatomy of the spine is, remembering that the vast majority of our lordosis is coming in at those lower two levels. So I like to put those uh, dramatically angulated cages down at the bottom more so than at upper levels. Here's some slides of some of the, uh, those cages that have been placed. <clears throat> and you can see these are at approximately four months after the operation, you can see there. And you can see that there's already, uh, at least at the early stages, direct bone-to-bone -bone apposition <coughs> at, at the uh, implant site, uh, the internal characteristics of which I can't say yet at this point in time. Again, here is, uh, placement of those cages uh, uh, with the old technology over on the left, but the new technology uh, of uh, Kyocera over on the right-hand side. And this is something that I'll be interested in, in following over time because 
as I've mentioned, and we've been talking about, <clears throat> the biology and the histology of these implant plants is absolutely remarkable and dramatic at times. And I wonder, with uh, the ability of these bones to oppose themselves into um, uh, the cages and the vertebral bodies above and below, much like those uh, sacroiliac pegs that we talked about at the beginning of the conference today, uh, I wonder if simple apposition of the bone into these cages left alone so that that's, that um, segment does not move, do we ultimately, will we ever even need to necessarily put bone graft in there or not? Will bone graft be absolutely necessary or will just the device alone be satisfactory? But that will remain <laughs> to be seen in animal-like studies. And here's one final example. Again, this was taken only at two months after the new uh, uh, technology came out. <clears throat> and you can already see that there's bone graft that is uh, still in the process of fusing within that cage, but you can see all the way around, there's direct bone on bone apposition uh, here. I will take you know one step uh, aside, however, and remind everybody that just like most of orthopedics and spine surgery in definite particular, that so much of what we do depends upon your skill and techniques as a surgeon. The uh, preparation of the uh, end plates, the removal of all the disc material, the selection of the careful, of the appropriate size for the uh, space available, all that is gonna have as much if not more impact on your ability to achieve a fusion as opposed to picking a certain implant out of the box in the back and putting it in. So we don't forget that, and I will do a lot of carpentry in the front part of the disc space to level off and smooth off those surfaces because these things that I'm putting in there are not beveled or bent or curved. They're straight and they're flat, and you would, the more straight and the flat your surface, the better chance you're going to get that apposition that we so long for and that we can uh, uh, count on. So again, thank you for this uh, uh, mini sales pitch, but I think the technology is, is uh, exciting and important, and it's one that I certainly believe in. So thank you very much. So Kirk, thank you. Uh, great stuff. Go back to that CT. Maybe stay on this one. It's actually a good slide. Uh, so talk about subsidence. So uh, subsidence is a multivariable thing. You talked about how many different uh, angles and how pleomorph uh, the human intervertebral space is, level by level and individual by individual with surrounding biomechanics. What is uh, a subsidence dependent upon and how is that different from these kind of uh, woven surface cages versus a more rigid traditional cage that had a much larger surface area in terms of uh, uh, material apposition to the host? Well, again, <laughs> subsidence, as you know, is where uh, that cage somehow migrates above or below, you know, through the end plate and into the vertebral body. Um, the old orthopedic principles and the old spine principles still do and always will apply in remembering that the most rigid part of the vertebral end plates is out at the periphery, not in the middle. So the choice of, if you can, the larger possible cage that you can put in there will send that those rigid sort of uh, uh, perimeters of whatever device you put in there out on the more rigid bone and should lessen the chances of subsidence. Number two, obviously the quality of bone in general. Subsidence has a much higher chance of taking place in the osteopenic individual than somebody who's got robust uh, osseous uh, uh, integrity. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> finally, it's again, getting back to your your surface, uh, uh, your, your surgical technology, uh, the careful removal of the end plate, uh, but not over debriding. When we were putting, uh, when Jens and I were little boys and we were first putting femoral rings into uh, the spine, we oftentimes uh, carved a little holes into the end plates, especially the sacrum, to get bone to grow, the blood to come up in there and fuse for you. Uh, but you would like to prepare uh, the end plates, remove the disc material, remove the osseo remains of the, the cartilaginous end plate, but that's about it. Remember that punctate, like pink ble bleeding, so to speak, that's what you want. If you see robust bleeding coming out of the end plates, uh, you might be at issue later on. So again, a lot of it's the surgical template. 
I don't know of any literature uh, evidence in terms of how important subsidence is in terms of uh, pain, postoperatively or not, but I would be uh, certainly interested in reading that. Great. Uh, our partner, Mir Abdul-Jabbar, he's watching live. By the way, we have well over 300 live YouTube viewers also, so thanks. You're a very, very big draw. Thank you. You, you are some <laughs> um, organizer, that's for sure. Uh, Amir, do you have a question for Dr. Wood? Yes, can you hear me okay? Is my mic working okay? Yeah, mic and camera working well. This is amazing. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I never Thank you so much for the talk. It was a wonderful talk. Um, you know, I feel like for, you know, looking back at the origin origins of uh, the indications for BMP, you know, ALIF was what the FDA trial was for, and that's the only true on-label use, some would say. Um, and with uh, what you're mentioning with this technology, uh, mentioning using bone graft only, mentioning not using bone graft at all. Um, how uh, how has this changed your practice in terms of what you're using for your inner body cage? Well, I may be one of the <clears throat> only people in the world who still uses uh, the bone, the trephine bone harvesting that Cynthia's introduced about a thousand years ago. And I would love to look at uh, my results of that, but I that would mean finding these people again uh, and seeing how well it fused. But what I will do if possible, because the bone is sitting right there, and remember there's more osteogenic progenitor cells in vertebral bodies than there is in the iliac crest. So I core out a 15 or 17 millimeter core out of the vertebral body uh, and a 15 millimeter core plugs a 13 millimeter cage and a 17 millimeter core plugs a 15 millimeter cage perfectly. And that, you know, I cut off the end plate and that becomes my bone graft. Uh, it takes just a few, a uh, couple of minutes to do that. It's cheap, it's free, and it's easy. Um, and I don't, again, I don't know that I can recall any complications uh, that of that sort of thing. And is its fusion rate better than BMP or anything else? I really can't say. But there have been times when I could not get to the bone to take it out, and I have used uh, BMP, uh, and it seems to be you know quite successful. Um, but to answer your question, um, I you know I think everybody's still going to put something in there. Um, there are all sorts of bone substitutes that you can use, but I don't know, you know, their success rate. But I think, you know, like some of the studies that, uh, that I quoted there, <clears throat> animal studies might suggest uh, that you don't need to, but a true randomized prospective study is going to be difficult because you're going to talk to the half the patients and tell them you're not going to get bone graft in there and we're just going to see if the metal alone is all we need to do. So great minds think alike because our good friend, uh, Professor Tariq Sohail from Lahore, Pakistan, just asked the same question. Is nanoengineering actually replacing biologics or not? I think ultimately it will. And when we have the, you know, sort of the uh, <clears throat> scientific integrity or and confidence, in other words, to do so, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, in five, 10 years from now, we're not even harvesting bone graft, just putting these things in there. Um, excellent point. So um, I think Bob Hart was on for a while and he's off again. His wife is ill, so he sends his regards to he wanted to be here very much. Um, and that's a question. We were uh, demonstrating on the Berkeley campus together many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Can you go back to the lordosis angle? So this is one of those things that I always struggle with, as you saw in my case. Um, These? Yeah, bingo. So. There's a huge temptation, especially at the lumbosacral junction, to kind of do hyperlordotic cages, and there are many manufacturers who talk about that now. How much does the patient anatomy versus a biomechanical calculation uh, um, kind of influence your choice of an angulation? Well, again, I, I try to mimic the normal um, patient anatomy. And as I, I round it up and down a few degrees, but you basically remember it, the 12, one is zero degrees. One, two is five, 10, 15, 20, and 25 is what uh, I call L5 S1. So if I can get something in the twenties, uh, that's what I aim for. <laughs> but the patient may not be lying on the table to fit a 28 degree cage. 
<coughs> and as you can see, there's very little cage way back here. And if for whatever reason, you'd like to have some uh, indirect decompression of the, dis of the disk space, the frame and or the central canal, it's gonna be very difficult with something hyperlordotic like that. So you may be sacrificing some uh, relief of nerve pain uh, for some form of architecture. Um, so, I mean, I tried, I will, I rarely have, a, I don't know that I've used a 28, but I, I've put 22s, and then at 4, 5, I go 17, and 3, 4, I go 12, and that sort of thing. Yes, Joe? One second, we need to get a microphone. Yeah. I'm Joe. I'm Joe. Yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah. Ages, but, um, yeah, so, so I've, I've actually, I've actually heard some commentary, and this is just obviously anecdotal, but from surgeons, but to your point about that, you know, the, uh, the back, a lot of surgeons want to know what the height of the posterior is, because, you know, obviously historically it's like when you put a cage in and you got an indirect decompression, you, you obviously got to, you know, increase that height in the middle column. But I have heard that some surgeons are concerned about some, you know, radiculopathy or radiculitis that comes with, you know, you may be getting, there's a trade-off between the, uh, uh, you know, trying to get somebody in, in, in the right um, form, but at the same time, they're losing, you know, you, you might have a, uh, you know, create a, an issue that you don't have. Well, you remember, the, I mean, the original BAK cages, which were probably, you know, the first uh, uh, metallic sort of, or artificial implants, you know, were fraught with many cases of uh, L5 radiculopathy from stretch uh, <laughs> sort of situations. So that is always a possibility. But I would also caution everybody that even though we've got all sorts of sizes <clears throat> that are available in terms of the height, you can't, you can't put something, you cannot make a cage tall enough with 28 degrees if the height, is, it, until you get to a certain height. I'm saying that wrong. What I mean to say is you, there's no such thing as an 11 millimeter cage uh, height that has 28 degrees because there's no more, you can't angle them because there's no more metal in, in, in the back. So those 28 guys only start at 13 or 15. Now go back to the, uh, the screw slide. If you go back a little bit more, maybe that's a good one to show that. So this is a beautifully done case there. Uh, Talk to us about the purpose of these screws. When I was uh, in a younger sta state, we'd put these large 6.5 screws in with sometimes with a wash or some without as an interference screw to prevent backing out of our femoral rings, which is still my right. favorite anterior cage until now. <laughs> yeah. um, what is the actual purpose of these devices? Do they have a rigid holding function now? Are they locked, fixed static screws, or are they still an interference screw that prevents backing out or uh, uh, mobility of the cage. Do they hold the vertebrae together? Somewhat, I would say. You, we, you're putting four of these things in there. They're 4.5 millimeter screws. They don't grab any end plates, uh, really, other than the, the end plate that they enter uh, at, the, at the very beginning. But there's, a, there's no real stop. They're not fixed to the plate. So you go until it's sunk low enough and then um, yeah, you, had that other slide. you can yeah. see over on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, there's a, a, pl a little um, plate that goes in the front that prevents any screw back out, which works very, very well. And <clears throat> does it hold it there? Uh, again, these have been shown in biomechanical testing. <clears throat> if you've got four of them to be equivalent of a single uh, posterior construct left alone, but they're also useful in that if there is a suggestion of loosening or pseudoarthrosis, you will start to see it around these screws before you see it around anything else. So because some manufacturers have these screw heads actually uh, thread into the cage, and this is obviously not a design feature. So these are not rigid locking, more interference screws. Final question, we are running out of time. Uh, bone density, is there a critical bone mass? Do you still get DEXA scans, uh, non-spinal DEXA scans, I assume, or do you use Hounsfield units now as a critical lowest uh, kind of a number that you use and which you're willing to do a more or less elective anti-antibody fusion? 
If somebody's uh, on DEXA scan osteoporotic, I will have them, we have a wonderful woman down at Stanford uh, who takes care of uh, everybody who's uh, coming in to see us as well as other disciplines for bone uh, maintenance, bone health maintenance. And we will have that done for elective purposes um, for uh, six months before reevaluating the situation. If they're osteopenic and otherwise healthy, my sense is that that's okay, but I haven't studied it. Okay. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming all the way up here <laughs> and spending time with our fellows last night. It's uh, always cool to see, and your, your points are well taken. I, we know and appreciate just the critical minds. So I want to return that compliment. I mean, mm -hmm. and all the best. And it's great to have you here. And uh, I thank all our online visitors for their engagement. And we had a very large uh, attendance here, well over 300 now. So appreciate it very much, Kirk. No, thank you, Jens. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ben, tell us when we're offline.